Good morning. I'm Nicole Etchison from the Department of History at Ball State University, and it is my distinct pleasure and honor this morning to introduce James H. Madison, the Thomas and Catherine Miller Professor Emeritus of History at Indiana University. He is an award-winning teacher and the author of many, many books, including Eli Lilly, A Life, A Lynching in the Heartland, Race and Memory in America, and Slinging Donuts for the Boys, An American Woman in World War II. His most recent book is Hoosiers, A New History of Indiana, which is on display outside. For many years, he co-edited the Indiana University Press series Midwestern History and Culture, which included a book he edited, edited entitled Comparative Histories of the Midwestern States. Jim says he is very proud, in a modest Hoosier way, that the Midwestern History Association bestowed on him the Frederick Jackson Turner Lifetime Achievement Award. I have known Jim many years since I was a student, his student, back at Indiana University, and I am willing to testify that he has solid Midwestern values, unfailing kindness and decency, an unflagging work ethic, and solid common sense. Jim represents the best of what it means to be Midwestern, but he has never romanticized Midwestern history. We pride ourselves on being nice, but we don't always live up to that ideal. So today, Jim will be speaking on a darker side of the Midwestern past. He's going to be talking about who's an American, the rise and fall of the Ku Klux Klan in the Midwest. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you all for coming out this morning and listening to a subject that may not be as bright as it is outside, but a subject that I think is important. I do want to thank Grand Valley State University, the Howenstein Center, Graves Whitney, Scott St. Louis, the staff, the leaders of our Midwestern History Association, Ted Franz, Sarah Eggy. John Lauk, and many others who make this organization what it has become in five short years. And I say that with deep hope and optimism that that trajectory will continue to move upward in the coming years. I want to, in a very, very quick and kind of dirty way, for which I'll apologize only this once, talk to you about the Ku Klux Klan, convince you that the Klan story is relevant and important, convince you to incorporate the story or a part of the story into the history that you do, whatever form of history you do. It's an old, old story, and yet I want to assert it's also a new story, a story that connects to the center of our nation's history. This is not a story for the margin, for the sidebar. This is a story that goes in the center of our textbook, our minds and hearts, as we think about the question, who is an American? A story that paraded proudly down Pennsylvania Avenue. It's a story that spans a century of time, from 1920 to recent events in Charlottesville and elsewhere. A story of white supremacists, to be sure, but much, much more than white supremacists. We have advantages today in telling this story that we did not have a generation or two ago. There's new scholarship, lots of good new scholarship on the Klan. Yet, after several weeks of doing a cursory investigation of that scholarship in the Midwest, I have to also report that there is not nearly enough scholarship for any of the states, the communities, or the region as a whole. There are so many areas of opportunity to plow through the sources and create your own stories about the Klan, and I want to convince you to try to do that. Among the advantages we have, in addition to pretty good foundations of secondary scholarship, our primary sources, the newly digitized sources, particularly of newspapers, which those of you who do research in primary sources know, are a gem. Folks of my generation, I think, are owed reparations for having lifted 
bound newspaper volumes and cranking microfilm. I have thousands of hours invested in that, as some of you old timers do also. We should get payback for that in some way. It feels like I'm cheating when I go to the digitized newspapers, but boy, are they wonderful for a subject like the Klan. Here's the one that drove me. I've been focusing mostly on Indiana. Uh, it's based in Indianapolis, but the Fiery Cross, the leading Klan newspaper in the North, publishes widely stories from across the Midwest and will use, be useful to anyone, and it's completely digitized and searchable. Let me make some key generalizations to spark your interest. This is the, these are the words of Elmer Davis, the distinguished reporter from New York who came out to Indiana, his native birthplace, to study the Klan in 1924. And this is what he concluded. These were marginal people. They were the great unteachables. Now, I want to say, after 40 years in the classroom, I want to hope that no one is unteachable. I had a few students who were close to that, maybe. <laughs> but we're all teachable. I don't agree with Davis on that point, that word, but more importantly, most of the Midwesterners who joined the Klan were not marginal. They were mainline, mainstream Midwesterners. They were not abnormal, maybe not even wicked. We now have very good analyses of Klan memberships in some locations. And there's a project that we desperately need to have more of. The location and the analyses of Klan membership lists. But we have enough now to have some idea of who these men with their backs turned to the camera, preparing to be initiated, naturalized into the Klan, who they were, what kind of people they were in a socioeconomic way, at least. And so the question is, who joined? The great Midwestern novelist Booth Tarkington said that it was the rank and file of good, honest people who joined the Ku Klux Klan. And that's often the case, probably mostly the case. These were people of the heartland, the friendliest people on earth, the nice people, good Methodists, good lawyers, good merchants, Lions Club members, church women, proudly joined the Klan, this group posing with their masks down because they're very proud members of the women's Ku Klux Klan. Here is one of the greatest challenges in telling this story. It takes a theologian or some other insight to connect good people and what we today would describe unanimously, I'm sure, evil. Where was the Klan popular? Everywhere. Across this country. Certainly in the South, but also in the North. In fact, there were probably in the 1920s more Klan members in the North than there were in the South. And it was certainly popular in the Midwest, in all the Midwestern states, in most communities in those states, most regions in those states, and especially so in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. This was the heartland of the Klan. Here's their definition of themselves. They were Americans. They were 100% Americans, and that's a wonderful figure to introduce to students and others. What does it mean, 100% American, compared to only 99% American? Here's their definition. These are the characteristic pure white, and they use that word pure again and again in newspapers, speeches, propaganda. Pure white race, native born, militantly Protestant, and aggressively patriotic. These are 100% Americans in a Protestant country, as this minister in Des Moines told his audience. Militantly Protestant, this is the badge, the logo that's worn on the front of the robe of Klan members. It's the cross, it's the red, it's the drop of blood that Christ shed for all. Mainline Protestants, 
Methodists, Baptists, Disciples of Christ, Presbyterians, Quakers, who had their churches at rural crossroads in big cities, in county courthouse squares, where Klan members often showed up on a Sunday morning, marched to the altar, left a contribution, and joined the congregation in singing Onward, Christian Soldiers. The Klan at rallies and parades always displayed the cross, the burning cross, the symbol of their religious belief, the light of their world, the fire of their hearts. And the American flag, a patriotic flag that flew at all Klan events. A religious and patriotic conviction that America was in decline, that there were enemies at the gates, even inside the gates, causing a turning away from that cross and that flag. The Klan was brilliant in creating the dichotomy of us and them, of those people, the others, of defining who the enemy was and what the enemy was threatening to do. So who's the enemy? The largest, most important enemy for the Ku Klux Klan in the Midwest are Catholics. Now, I want to say that again because that's commonly not understood. And I don't think there's any doubt in the mind of any scholar, certainly in the writing of any scholar, on the Klan in the Midwestern reason, region that that is true. The largest enemy in numbers and power and threat were Catholics. Many of you will understand this. Many Americans today do not understand, have no sense of anti-Catholicism, which was deep in the DNA of Americans from the beginning down maybe to the 1960 presidential election. A vicious distrust of a foreign church led by a foreign pope. Goodness gracious, the pope didn't even speak English, did he? That was engaged in a conspiracy to undermine basic American values, not just Protestantism, but particularly the schools. There's a lot of focus in Klan action on public schools and the threats that parochial schools, Catholics, offer to the public school tradition in America. This, is, this anti-Catholicism is everywhere, even in beautiful new suburbs like Oak Park outside of Chicago, where the women organized a Ku Klux Klan clavern in order to stop the flow of Catholics into their lovely middle-class neighborhood. Anti-Catholicism, Catholics, the first enemy. And of course, immigrants, and these are often the same, Catholic immigrants pouring into America. And this, of course, is the tail end of the period of the largest, longest pour of foreign people into the United States. Nativism, I think I need not tell you, is deep in the American soul. They must be turned aside, these invaders from across the Atlantic. Jews were the enemy. This is an example that comes from Dearborn, Michigan. Henry Ford, brilliant innovator, entrepreneur, business leader, a notorious anti-Semite, spreading the word in his newspaper, the Dearborn Independent. African Americans. African Americans were the enemy. Race divided Americans in the 1920s. It divided Midwesterners, I think, in our history from the very beginning down to the present, more than any other line of division in our region. 
And so African Americans were certainly the enemy. They were not the largest enemy because there were so many ways to keep black Midwesterners in their place before and after the Klan that there wasn't a whole lot of work for the Klan to do with this particular enemy. So these are the enemies. Catholics first, immigrants, Jews, African Americans, us, the good Americans, the 100% Americans who are going to redeem America from these enemies. What are the issues? We've got to stop this horde of immigrants coming into our country. We've got to close the door to them. And that happened in one of the most significant pieces of national legislation ever passed, the National Origins Quota Act of 1924, which created a quota system that allowed folks from Northern and Western Europe to enter in large numbers, larger numbers than those from Southern and Eastern Europe, the lesser people, the darker people, the more Catholic people, the more Jewish people are pretty much turned away by this 1924 legislation. It was a great success for the Klan. The Klan pushed it aggressively. And while many forces contributed to its passage, certainly the Klan was among them. And taking credit, the imperial wizard, the national leader of the Klan, Harem Evans, told an Indiana audience that now America has built a stone wall around the nation, so tall, so deep, so strong, that the scum and riffraff of the old world cannot get into our gates. These immigrants, these others, were the cause of many problems. I think the largest problem they caused was alcohol in a time of prohibition. This too is a long story in many Midwestern communities. The enforcement of prohibition was the number one policy issue. It had been pushed hard by Protestants for over, since the 1840s at least in many parts of the Midwest, especially by Protestant church women concerned about what they saw as the decline of family life, the growing corruption that came with the sale and manufacture of alcohol. All the more upsetting because it was quite clear that the authorities were not adequately enforcing the law of the land and the law of the states that some people like this swell crowd, I think this is Madison, Wisconsin, were mocking prohibition, not just disobeying the law. Prohibition is the number one issue, but there were lots of other signs of moral decline. These flappers, this is something not old but new in the 1920s, fueled by booze and new music. It was the music of the jungle the Klan claimed that they were dancing to and listening to. And of course, backseat sex, the arrival of the automobile across the Midwest changed lives in so many ways, including new opportunities for new sins or old sins in new garb. <laughs> I love this broadside from the Klan in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, listing all the problems and challenges you can't read all the details there, but you can find this, and many of the images I'm presenting this morning, uh, particularly on the sites of our wonderful state and local historical societies. You know them all, but we need to shout out our enthusiasm and gratitude to the Midwestern state historical societies, from Wisconsin to Ohio, to Nebraska, to Iowa and all the others who have for generations been gathering the primary sources and now wonderfully digitizing their collections so that we, so that anyone, anywhere in the world with computer access can look at these images and read some of the documents and create your own stories about the Klan. So I love this, uh, this broadside from Lincoln from the Nebraska Historical Society. 
The last issue is petting parties, a menace to national morality. Married men, do your joyriding with your own wives. All this is encouraged by Hollywood films, which are, of course, according to the Klan, made by Jews and Catholics to corrupt youthful Americans. Hollywood films that play in small town movie theaters, not in, just in big city Chicago theaters. In darkened theaters, a Klan newspaper wrote, couples sit close together to watch sex filth, distorted history, and vicious and degrading phases of immorality. What did the Klan do to advance the cause? Publicity, propaganda, persuasion, advocacy. In many traditional ways, just like Midwesterners had always done, they had parades of robed figures usually almost always led by a marching band. They gathered at state fairs grounds, at state fair time. There's a wonderful subject I hope someone takes up. We've had, we have some scholarship on state fairs in the Midwest. We know how important they are, were and are. And uh, the Klan was there at the state fair. Yeah, I think in most states, I'm not certain, but I think in many, if not most, I love the marching bands. Uh, this is one of the most famous from Muncie, Indiana. The Muncie band, Klan band, traveled around the region. Uh, here they are getting ready to march. I love this photograph because if you can see in the front is a saxophone player. I think that's a baritone sax in a marching band. I had always assumed, and maybe someone knows, that the saxophone was the instrument of the devil in the 1920s. <laughs> But here it is in the Muncie Klan Band. So whoever's going to write about Klan bands needs to explain, too, how a saxophone appeared in this one and maybe why it didn't in one in Madison, Wisconsin. I don't know. Parades on holidays such as the 4th of July. And someone can probably identify some of these buildings in Grand Rapids. Parades with floats, lots of floats, with all sorts of messages, often about saving the little red schoolhouse from Catholics. Um, floats specifically done by the women of the Ku Klux Klan. That's a subject, by the way. We know a little bit about women in the Klan, but not nearly as much. So far as I know, no one has yet found a membership list of a women, women's clan organization. That would be exceedingly valuable. The assumption is that the women were pretty much like the men who joined the clan, good, middle class, hardworking, honest Midwesterners. Um, rallies, such as this one in Madison, Wisconsin, with band concerts, lectures, parade around the Capitol, naturalization, swearing in of new members, fireworks, a picnic in central Illinois with all sorts of entertainment. These were festivals. These were people, places for people of like-minded sort to get together, to enjoy the way they had enjoyed before and after the Klan, but now with this more than twist of Klan speeches and programs. This ad is particularly interesting because it includes at the bottom the names of the sponsors, the local businesses in Girard, Illinois, including the local Ford dealership, which tells us, as so many sources do, Again, that this was a picnic attended not by people abnormal and out of the mainstream, but by the good, honest, to God-fearing people in this central Illinois town. The parades had messages. One school, the Protestant school, one law, the Protestant law, the Protestant flag and symbol in Topeka, Kansas. I don't 
know if you can see the back window of this automobile. Uh, it's interesting, all the figures, you could spend a lot of time when you, when you have these on your own computer. You blow up the images and you look at the details. And they're all looking back toward the camera. They didn't remove their masks, but this person in the back looking out the window and you just see her or his eyes looking out the back of that car. It's very sweet. <laughs> it's a common Klan activity to donate an American flag to the schools, to all the schools in the township or the city, to rural schools like this one in Ohio, gathering in their robes to present the children this symbol of their America. Robe clans people showed up at funerals and weddings and baptism. There are lots of images of these events, these religious events with clan members in robes in our state historical society collections. These Parades and rallies and picnics are more traditional forms of advancing the cause, but the Klan was not a traditional organization. In fact, it was very innovative. It was progressive. It was on the cutting edge of technology of the 1920s, on the cutting edge of salesmanship. This is the decade in which salesmanship became a notable expertise, area of expertise, and propaganda. And the Klan leadership was very, very good at this, including the making of their own films to counter the rot that was coming out of Hollywood. This is The Toll of Justice, one of the most uh, widely shown films made by the Ku Klux Klan to present the Klan story. The Klan also produced its own music, 100% American songs for the Dubuque County Klan Quartet, uh, phonograph records made at various studios around the Midwest. One of the largest one was in Richmond, Indiana, uh, where they recorded dozens of Klan records. At the same time, ironically, uh, the studio in Richmond recorded a young trumpet player from New Orleans, his first recording, and it was, of course, Louis Armstrong in the same studio. Oh, they might have, the Klan and Louis Armstrong might have passed uh, entering the door. Films, music, radio, the Klan was early adopters of radio. The Grand Dragon, uh, Imperial Wizard, Hiram Evans, gave an address called The Klansman of the Nation from Kansas City, uh, reaching into other Midwestern states as far as Indiana. Again, sophisticated. Airplanes, as we heard yesterday morning, Midwesterners looked up. The Klan looked up, and overhead at a rally was an airplane, often trailing a cross or a flag and or a flag. These were not rubes in bedsheets. Klan violence. Here's a tough subject, and I want to be very careful in how I talk about it. Because there's a widespread assumption that the Klan was about violence, that the Klan was about lynching. First of all, I'm talking exclusively about the Klan in the Midwest in the 1920s. Not other places, not the godforsaken South, for goodness sakes. I didn't mean that, did I? The Midwest in the 1920s, not other times. It's commonly assumed the Klan was lynching African Americans, just like this still from Birth of a Nation depicts, all across the region in the 20s, and it's simply not true. Again, there's considerable research still to be done, but the best scholarship I know and what I've learned in the last few years shows very little, surprisingly little violence on the part of the Ku Klux Klan. And I'm talking now about documented evidence, the kind that scholars expect to have to draw a conclusion, to make a statement. 
I've had for many, many years an offer of $50 for anyone who can show me a case of a documented Klan lynching in Indiana, of anyone, black, white, Jew, Catholic, anyone. So far, I still have my $50, and I've raised it to $100 recently uh, for documented evidence. So far, none, zero. None in Indiana. And I'm not going to say none anywhere else. Some of you may have documented evidence, and I'd be happy to, to know about it. Now, having said that, that violence by the Klan was slight, especially compared to common assumptions today, I want to quickly say that the Klan did engage in significant levels of threat, of intimidation. After all, part of the reason for the mask and the robe is to cower people, to intimidate them as you march down the streets of Grand, the main street of Grand Rapids, a thousand strong, to send a message. Part of the reason of burning a cross on a lawn or in front of a Catholic church was to send a message. Even soaping the screens of a window in a home with the letters KKK sent a message, a powerful message, and a significant amount of the Klan's influence and power and the ability to keep people who may have known and thought differently quiet rather than stand up came from this intimidation, this threat, this sense of power which was deliberate and aggressively used by sophisticated leaders of the Ku Klux Klan. Now there is some violence. In northern Indiana, it was almost certainly the Klan that firebombed the residence of a Catholic priest. No one was hurt. One of the most egregious cases of violence comes in southern Illinois in bloody Williamson County, as many of you know. Uh, where tensions between Italians and miners mixed with the Ku Klux Klan to, to cause some significant violence. But again, those such instances, so far as I know, are the exception rather than the everyday activity of the Ku Klux Klan in the Midwest in the 1920s. Rather than physical violence, the Klan wisely, I think, entered politics. Oh, here's the militia called out in Williamson County. <coughs> Excuse me. The best I can tell you, and I've heard this at other sessions today when others have talked about the Midwest, is there's lots of variation in the Midwest, right? Uh, there's dynamism, there's fluidity, and that's certainly true of the Klan. It's almost certainly that the Klan was politically stronger in Indiana than in many other Midwestern states. It was probably weaker in these other states, at least three of which passed laws prohibiting the wearing of masks in public places. That was one common political response to the Klan at the state and local levels. Some communities, towns and cities, passed anti-mask laws. And there was variation within states even, as this example from what I think we know about these communities in northern Ohio suggests. An essential part of the Klan story is opposition. And it's logical to conclude, and correct to conclude, that the largest opposition to the Ku Klux Klan in the Midwest in the 1920s came from Catholics, the largest enemies, and larger in numbers and more effectively organized with access to resources to stand up to the Klan. And this is the major, there were many others, but this is the major Catholic organized response to the Klan, the formation of the American Unity League, the AUL based in Chicago, with offices in Indianapolis and working at other places, uh, produced speakers, a speakers bureau, 
and a newsletter called, fittingly, Tolerance. Tolerance is an interesting read. Uh, it may not all be true, but then not everything in the Fiery Cross or other Klan newspapers was true either. But an interesting read condemning the Klan, uh, calling them out, mocking them, making fun of them, and very interestingly, acquiring, stealing, membership lists from Klan headquarters and pu publishing them, printing them in the pages of the Tolerance. They did that for, uh, for Indianapolis, for Dubuque, for Chicago, and other locations. Of course, Jewish Americans stood up to the Klan when they could and where they could, often too small in numbers, particularly in small towns, to do much. But in some larger places, some larger cities, local community, Jewish community organizations did attempt to respond, and some rabbis were very outspoken in opposing the Klan. African Americans, of course, this to me is a fascinating part of the Klan story. Uh, in some places, probably many places, African Americans in 1924, when the Klan was at its most active political moments, 1924 elections, uh, African Americans switched from the long tradition since Abraham Lincoln of voting Republican to vote Democrat for the first time. The sh foreshadowing of what would become part of the New Deal coalition of the 1930s. As important or more important, African Americans formed branches of the NAACP. Some have been formed in the teens, but in the 20s, NAACP branches really took off across the Midwest in response in significant part to the threat that black Midwesterners saw from the Ku Klux Klan. <clears throat> this is a very interesting part of the story, and the benefit of it are the sources. Because if some of you may know, the papers of the NAACP are in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. They're the largest collection in the entire Library of Congress manuscript decision, division, and they are wonderful papers. I've been through them for Indiana and a few other places. I encourage you, if you have interest, to get into those papers. They're organized by state and within state by community, so they're very, very easy to get those Hollinger boxes on your desk and go through them and get really into, inside, an African-American community in a particular place. To see divisions within the African-American community, as in this instance, they struggle, they debate, how to respond to the Klan. Should we put our heads down and go along because it's very dangerous to respond, to stand up, or should we stand up? Should we speak out? And in this case, at the Indianapolis branch, which became very active in the 1920s, they decided to stand up and stand out. And they organized some rallies in cooperation with some Jewish and Catholic fellow citizens. There's general opposition. Within some Protestant churches, the Detroit Methodist Church Conference passed a resolution of condemnation of the Klan. Within individual congregations, among some ministers, though I should have perhaps said earlier that many Protestant ministers not just joined the Klan, and it appears that they got free membership, they didn't have to pay the dues, uh, but that became speakers really firemen for the Klan locomotive, Protestant ministers. Opposition within the Republican Party. Some Republican elected officials stood up to the Klan and opposed the Klan. Within community leaders and ordinary citizens, the Indiana Bar Association, surprisingly to me, passed a resolution of condemnation of the Klan. There was some opposition to the press press hero editors like William Allen White, but not many. Most newspapers, I think, certainly in Indiana, went along, remained silent, or endorsed the Klan. Only a handful really actively opposed it. 
Well, the Klan did decline and it did go away rather quickly in retrospect, though I think not for those people living at the time. Um, the death of this woman in 1925, the murder of this woman by this man in 1925 was the trigger. This is D.C. Stevenson, the Grand Dragon of Indiana, the most prominent Klan leader in the Midwest. Stevenson's influence and activities extended far beyond Indiana. He was trying to build a wide Klan network beyond his own state. He ended up in the Michigan City Penitentiary for the murder of Madge Oberholzer. Of course, the Klan then, not just in Indiana, but across the region, smelled like many, many day old fish. People ran aggressively from it as a consequence. But it's more than Stevenson. And this is a tangled story that still hasn't been told very well, I think, the decline of the Klan. I think some of it comes from the success of the Klan in solving the problem of immigration in the 1924 National Origins Quota Act. We've done that. We don't need to talk about immigration. Oh, they're still here, but they're not going to come anymore, and that problem is going to take care of itself. So we don't need to worry about that. And then perhaps I think there was disappointment with the Klan because the Klan was never able to live up to its promises in all sorts of ways. It promised to eradicate alcohol from the land. It promised to enforce rigidly the prohibition law and it failed to do that and anyone could see that alcohol was widely and readily obtained across the region. They could see that they were bootleggers, we blame them on Canada, coming across the border, as well as home brew. That alcohol was flourishing, and along with it flourished corruption of all sorts, of kickbacks and paybacks and bribery of officials, of, of elected uh, city and town and local officials, of police officials, a, a web of corruption that caused, I think, some Klan members to say, we've had enough of this, we're not paying our dues, we're turning away. So by the end of the decade, by the end of the 1920s, the Klan has been kicked out of the Midwest. And I think most Midwesterners decided we're just going to forget about it. It's over. It's done. In fact, by the 1930s, it was embarrassing to think about it, to think that I belong to the Klan, that my father, my grandmother belonged to the Klan. We don't want to talk about that. We'll just forget about it, sweep it under the rug, and it'll go away. This is a standard way for human beings and I rather think Americans especially to think about our history, our troubled past, to pretend it didn't happen, not to erase it so much as just forget it. There's a fascinating story that I don't have much time to talk about today, but some of you know parts of this story, I'm sure, of the way in which we've dealt with the memory of the Klan since the 1920s, the ways in which we have or have not acknowledged it in history textbooks, in school curricula, in museums. It was very controversial. Among the first documented displays of a Klan robe was in the Fort Wayne Museum in 19, well now I lost the date, 1979 I think, don't quote me on that. There's a wonderful little article in the ASLH publication about that display of the Klan, of a Klan robe, how how dangerous it was, how much effort it took to put that robe in the museum. So, is the Klan dead? Have we seen the end? This is my, one of my favorite Klan images. Not really dead. The biggest revival came following the civil rights movements of the 19, early 1960s. 
those demonstrations, those actions, those responses revived the Klan across the region uh, in the late 1960s. But it's a very different Klan, and this is what also causes misunderstanding of the Klan of the Midwest of the 1920s, because the Klan that returns or appears in the 1960s into the 70s and beyond is a very different Klan. They really are, in some ways, rubes and unteachables. Um, sort of my favorite Klan photographs. Uh, you may not be able to read the sign that the guy on your left is carrying. It's nice to be white, he's written on his sign. I just love that. It's nice to be white. I spent decades trying to teach students the difference between ITS and IT apostrophe S. <laughs> this great unteachable spells the word I apostrophe TS. I've never seen that anywhere else. But it's nice to be white. I honestly think sometimes that these are people not to be despised or hated, certainly, but almost to be embraced and loved and say, I feel sorry for you. You are so out of touch with the world in which you live. It's a sad clan that returned in the 1960s and 70s. I, uh, I don't think I revealed this. I, I'm just about finished a book on the Klan, uh, mostly Indiana. But the last two chapters are about these fellows. And my wife read it and said, why do you have to go on and on about them? Um, and so I cut some of it. <laughs> but they are intriguing. They pull us in. They still pull in the television cameras. You know, we want to be on the news tonight out of Grand Rapids. All we have to do is go out here somewhere and burn a cross, and the helicopter will be, I don't know if they have a helicopter in Grand Rapids, be over top taking photographs and images, and we'll get interviewed if we put on robes and burn a cross. There's something that pulls us into these people. They're very small in numbers. The clan that appears in the Midwest in the late 60s very small in numbers, basically powerless. They show up at demonstrations and events, and always there are more police officers than Klan members, more officers not in uniform, probably, than Klan members. They're there to protect the Klan. So they're still here. They are different in that their focus has been mostly on white supremacy, on the pure white race, an attack against African Americans, vicious, racist stuff that comes out of their mouths, not much out of their writings because they don't write very much. Um, vicious, racist, pure, bigoted racism of the worst sort. They have added some new conspiracies, some new enemies. It's interesting to me, in the 1990s, they added the LGBT enemy to their list of what was wrong with America. They've spawned descendants and variations down to Charlottesville. And this fellow in the foreground here is wearing the same insignia that folks in Springfield War in 1924. Among the organizers of the Charlottesville Rally of 2017 was Matt Heimbach from Southern Indiana. And I've sort of followed him. He's a media magnet. He's gotten dozens of interviews from press all over the world. Heimbach is no rube. Heimbach is a college graduate. Thank God not in Indiana, in Maryland. Uh, <laughs> He was a history major. He's no rube. He requires, others require, that we have answers to the question, who is an American? 
Who were these people marching down Pennsylvania Avenue? Who are their descendants today? What is our responsibility as citizens and as historians? I won't tell you your responsibility as a citizen because I believe in American ideals. That's for you to decide. But I will tell you as a historian, we have a responsibility to tell this story, to figure out ways to tell it accurately with documented evidence, to figure out ways to tell it effectively to all kinds of audience, not just to other historians. We can, we can get this pretty well, pretty quickly. But to the people. And this is where the Midwest began. This is where our historical societies began and our universities began. Frederick Jackson Turner called our state universities the people's universities. We have obligations to the people to tell this story in our scholarship, in public presentations, like the one in, of all places, Dearborn, Michigan, where there's a wonderful presentation of the history of the Klan in the Henry Ford, that great, great museum, where a third grader, whose name is James, one of the greatest kids in the world, one of the four greatest kids in the world, did understand last summer when we looked at this exhibit. And maybe couldn't put it into these words, but could probably get some sense of the importance of believing, of hoping that the moral arc of justice, that the moral arc bends toward justice. Thank you very much. We do have some time for questions. I've been asked if you would come up to the microphone to answer your, to ask your question and also to make your comment. And uh, I'm protected in all sorts of ways. I'm happy to have negative comments, challenging comments, not hostile where we are, not hostile, but challenging. Thank you. I won't be hostile, Jim. Thank you for your powerful talk. I'm wondering if you could say something about uh, World War I veterans yeah. I don't know if the American Legion, which yeah. was founded in Indianapolis, centered in, I don't know when that was founded, but was it appealing to veterans? Were they opposing? What was their presence? That's a great question. The question is about veterans in general and World War I. You have to, I didn't have time to do this, but World War I is a precursor to many of the issues I've talked about in all sorts of ways, and some of you know that very, very well. Uh, in, for veterans specifically, and again, it's impossible to generalize, but Greg Sumner's question was about the American Legion, which formed, was formed by veterans. The headquarters were in Indianapolis, but the Legion was all over the Midwest, very popular in rural communities, small town places, for a lot of reasons, uh, patriotic reasons. Uh, they fought for their country. They wanted to protect their country. They wanted to honor their country. But also in some Legion headquarters, some Legion places of gathering, at least. They also wanted to have a beer or a glass of gin. And uh, some of those Legion posts uh, provided that. I don't know how many and what. The question of whether the Legion, whether the Legion, Legion members were also Klan members is one I do not know the answer to with any precision. I know that the Klan, that the American Legion at its State Convention in Indiana uh, refused to pass a resolution condemning the Klan. A proposal was made to do so. They refused to pass it, as did all the major church denominations. Uh, I know that some members of the Legion were members of the Klan. I know that the dean of the Indiana University Law School, Paul V. McNutt, who became state and then national commander of the American Legion in the late 1920s, was asked to condemn the Klan. You would think a lawyer might step up. McNutt said no, he, didn't, he couldn't do that. He privately abhorred it in a letter, but would not say anything public, publicly, and got elected governor of Indiana in 1932 as a consequence of staying silent, I suspect. So I don't know, uh, and that's a very good question for others to look at. Yes, sir. Hi, um, first hello from an IU grad. Uh, so I appreciated a lot of what you said today, but 
I have some questions about white supremacy. Please. Um, and in particular, I'm always really struck by this framing of like the Klan or other hate groups as nice white people who do really reprehensible things because I think that sort of lends us to the argument you started to turn towards at the end that these are actually humans who should be pitied, right? That there's something sad or laughable about how they see the world. And I worry that that pity, that, that, that seeing that as laughable makes it easier for us to, um, I don't know, sort of turn away from the very real violence, whether it's physical or psychic or verbal, that comes from this kind of rhetoric. And so I don't know. I just wondered if you had any more thoughts on the stake of this sort of like nice white people who do bad thing framing of the Klan. Thank you. That's a wonderful comment, and I appreciate it very much. In fact, I'm going to get a recording of that and incorporate it into my manuscript. You've, <laughs> you've, uh, you've captured a fundamental issue that I've wrestled with again and again as I'm writing this. Um, and I don't really have a good answer. I've tried to be careful. I've gone through this. Other people have read this manuscript in addition to my wife, some in this room. Uh, and they've tried to help me on this issue. It's a very tough issue. Because I'm just not content, content, as some people are, to say, oh, the Ku Klux Klan, let them rot in hell. I can't do that. I think that's wrong. I think that's a disservice. Um, and I want to state again that my reaction, my thoughts about the Klan of the 1920s are very different from recent events. It was a different time, a different, a very, very different time from our place. And we all know that it's unfair to judge an earlier generation by our standards. So I'm trying very hard to put the Klan in the 1920s in the context of their time and their place. Very few people in the 1920s had any concept of what we would call multiculturalism or plurality or diversity. It was simply, it comes up a little bit, I didn't say this, it comes up a little bit in the AUL, the American Unity League. In some of their publications in Tolerance and elsewhere, in some of their speeches, they use words that sound a little bit like what we would call multiculturalism today. But that was very unusual, I think, in the 1920s. So this is, this is a real conundrum. And I guess I've tried to present, to tell the story in a way that allows the reader, in this case the reader of a, what I hope will be a book soon, I hope, uh, to come to her or his own conclusions. But it's important to think, to ask that question. Yes, Annalisa. Uh, thank you, Jim, so much for uh, a powerful and important talk. Uh, and I'm speaking here as somebody who's a 19th century historian, so I'm sort of trying to jump over that uh, century divide that we're both trying to deal with in terms of the history of racism in America. Uh, but given the fact, and obviously this is a very new discovery, but that particularly those three borderland states of the Midwest, Ohio, Illinois, and Indiana, um, were, as it turns out, filled with successful and thriving African-American farming communities um, in the 19th century, who seem to have been able to hold on to their land and their wealth uh, up until the rise of the Klan of the early 20th century. Um, and then also, uh, and you know, just being in these communities, whether from Western Ohio to Western Wisconsin, the ways in which the Klan was arising around these communities and expending massive amounts of energy to uh, terrorize um, and even physically destroy aspects of that, those communities. Um, I'm just wondering how you think our, our growing awareness of this different way of thinking about race in the rural Midwest, especially in those border, and the rise of the Klan might shape current and future scholarship um, in terms of how we understand the rise of the Klan in this period. Well, that's a, a long and complicated question. Let me take just a few pieces of it. Um, I think uh, 
First of all, on, on the African-American rural communities, and again, I'm, I'm, I am allowed to go outside of Indiana, <laughs> but I always get a little bit, a little bit uh, shaky, and when I'm in this audience especially, because some of you know much more about this than I do in your particular part of the Midwest. So I'll just say for Indiana, the, the black communities I know and that I've studied, uh, Lyle Station, Roberts Settlement, uh, the Weaver Settlement, Beach, uh, began to decline before the 1920s be for the same reason that small towns across the Midwest were struggling, because young people voted with their feet and moved to the city, to Indianapolis, to Chicago, to Detroit, uh, where there were opportunities. Opportunities in agricultural, uh, agriculture lessened in the early 20th century. Uh, they didn't want to live in small towns without all the stuff, movie theaters, of big cities. And so they left on their own and moved. These African-American communities in the Midwest, I think, are very important. And I agree with Annalie's assertion yesterday that they are understudied and very much need to be studied and incorporated, again, into our general understanding of the Midwest and of America. But I think these communities are beginning to wither before the 1920s. I know that they had been uh, threatened, intimidated, the object of white antipathy from the very beginning down into the 20th century. But I know of no significant Klan violence against any of these African American communities in Indiana in the 1920s. People, old timers in Lyle Station who I've interviewed talk about threats from the Klan in nearby Princeton, Indiana to come out and they said, we've got guns, we've got rifles, and they did. They had good hunting rifles and they were very good at shooting squirrels. They should, could have shot between the eyes of a hooded Klansman too. And the folks in Gibson were not stupid. They knew that. And I think they pretty much stayed away. So I don't know of any instance of the Klan or anyone else burning a rural black community in Indiana. Certainly there was intimidation and threat, again, and that's very important. There was segregation, there was discrimination, that's very important. But the other side of the story is, as Annalisa commented yesterday, the, these, these communities really did build prosperous agricultural economies. They created schools and churches, uh, and, and they, they, in the context of time and place and situation, they thrived. And the descendants who come back to these places for reunions every year or every other year celebrate a history that is sort of real, that is one of great pride and strength. So I think there's a lot of positive things to say about these rural black communities, and I think we all need to pay more attention to them and say more about them. Thank you. Yes. Hi. My name is Kevin Magruder. I'm an assistant associate professor of history at Antioch College in Yellow Springs, and we're 20 miles from Dayton. You may know this past Saturday, uh, the Klan marched in Dayton, yeah. and they pretty much shut down the city for that Saturday. It ended up being nine people. Uh, there were about nine Klan people. Nine, nine Klan people. people. About 1,500 <laughs> demonstrators. But I think the reason they were able to do that has to do with what you're talking about here is I think whether they're Rubes or Rhodes, or Rhodes Scholars, the Klan has a history of terror as a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. And people know what happened in Charlottesville. So anytime they come to a place, people have to be prepared for that happening. And I do think that what you presented, it seemed that you were underestimating the power of terror, whether violence is accompanying it or not. My family has roots in the South. My parents moved to Toledo in 1953. The first time they went out to dinner, uh, there was dirt in the salad that was delivered to them. Uh, the Klan might not have been present there, but what I, I don't hear, and I hope you have in your book, is whether the Klan is there or not, there's a smiley face racism in the Midwest that under this veneer of goodness, and that has to be challenged, um, that, um, and Christianity too, that that Christianity is not the Christianity of the Good Samaritan where we say, who is my neighbor? Mm 
And when we don't do that, that gives power to those nine people who might be rubes, but they shut that city down. That city spent $650,000 to in preparation. That's terror, and that has to be named. I thank you. I, I agree 100% with all that you've said. Um, I should probably stop there. I, I agree with all that you've said. Uh, the question for me is how, how we go about responding to this, and especially as historians and scholars. What is our best, what, what are the tools in our armor that we can best deploy to stand up to this? Um, I'm glad you cited Christianity. Uh, my great hero, Kurt Vonnegut, has this wonderful statement about, I never, I, I hear all sorts of Old Testament quotations, but I never hear any Christian quote the Beatitudes. I learned the Beatitudes growing up in Sunday school. Some of you did too. Where are the Beatitudes today? Where's the Good Samaritan? Um, the other issue, just quickly here, is yes, these people, you can call them evil if you want. I won't dispute that. Um, you can call them dangerous. You can call them terrorists. I won't dispute that. Um, but I would also argue that we have a constitution and American ideals that guarantee these fools the right to parade in Dayton, Ohio. I'm very sorry that they're doing it. It's a threat to American ideals. And this is not just about race, and it's not just about African Americans as the chief enemy today. It's about all Americans. All these issues are not about white or black. They're about America and Americans. Sorry, I'm starting to preach now. My wife's going to cut me off. <laughs> um, but we have to allow them to parade, I think. The hope was long not yet happened, that bringing them out into the light would expose them and they'd wither away. Well, uh, the numbers you cited, I hope, are correct, probably are. Nine clans people and 1,500 demonstrators. Still haven't withered away, but they're certainly not winning the battle. Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I want to echo my appreciation for the previous um, questions. Um, so some of those questions were on my mind as well. I'm thinking particularly um, kind of taking us back into the historical realm of the 1920s and with the qualifier that I am more of a 19th century historian whose tentative book title en uh, ends with the uh, with the 18, uh, with, uh, with the 1920s. Um, but I'm interested thinking about really exploring further this issue of not just looking at lethal violence, um, or, but of thinking about violence much more broadly, thinking about it as terror, as psychological, and really thinking about trauma. And I'm wondering what sources you see or have been part of your project or you would recommend for future projects that get at clan survivors' trauma from intimidation, from living with constant fear, and recognizing that this is very difficult, uh, that here we may be entering the realm of oral history. We do not have the type of documentation of psychological trauma and intimidation uh, to work with that we might wish. But honoring the fact that for those, and here I'm, I'm, you know, the main hat I wear as a scholar of African American history and indigenous history, um, that for them these, these events did register as very real, even if they were not the primary target um, or did not have as, uh, even if in a historical sense, we don't, we see Catholics as the main en enemy of the Klan. To people of color, it didn't feel that way. Uh, and how is their trauma to be honored and acknowledged and documented and researched uh, in the historical record, real as it was to them, yeah. and as it still is? Another very good question and comment, uh, full of, <laughs> many, many questions and possibilities. Um, it's very difficult to know. I think virtually impossible to know what this was like 
for victims. We have a few, a handful of accounts that I know, and I'm sure there are others that I don't know, in which later on people wrote memoirs. Uh, there was a minister who was run out of his church who wrote a memoir of what it was like and how horrible it was. What we don't have much of are oral history interviews, and it's too late now. Uh, the generation before us missed this chance, and I sort of hold, hold them accountable because uh, until very recently, until the 1980s, 90s even, scholars didn't really much, with a few exceptions, want to study this. And so the oral history projects, at least in Indiana, and maybe someone in Iowa or Kansas is sitting on a beautiful oral history project on the Klan, but not in Indiana, that, that would enable us to talk, even through oral history sources, about what it was like to be on the receiving end of Klan intimidation. And again, I reiterate what others have said. It's, it's the intimidation, it's the threat, and what that means for the individual, for that individual's family. Uh, that's so important and so very, very difficult to get at. Uh, Jim, uh, I'm probably asking you to do something here that, that is a historian you don't want to do, but it, it's to uh, kind of reflect on two eras, and one of them being the modern period. Um, Harry Truman said, as Americans, we tend to go through these periods where um, social factors in the case of the 20s, you know, immigration, modernization, et cetera, uh, demographic and social change, uh, produced paroxysms of paranoia, he called it, in which um, we mainstream the more evil parts of the American psyche. It bubbles to the surface in ways that maybe it's tamped down uh, in other periods and we see a little more of the better angels, angels of our nature in those other periods. Uh, we're in a period now that some would say that we've seen a mainstreaming of some of that less desirable behavior. Do you see analogs between where America was in the 1920s politically and socially that produced the Klan and where we are today that has produced potentially an analog to that kind of thing, and certainly Charlottesville? Yes, <laughs> I do. And it scares the bejesus out of me. And no, I don't. <laughs> How's that for a historian's answer, right? <laughs> yes and no. Boy, the students not like that. Last there, question. There are no true-false answers, but, but I think there are enough, you know, someone said history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. I think there are enough rhymes here to make me a little anxious, but these are different times. And very quickly, I think, I think there are more people today standing up to whatever it is that does not comport with American ideals than there were in the 1920s. There are more profiles in courage. There are more genuine attentions to American ideals, I think, I hope. Yes. My perception is at the present time there's a growing support for white supremacy in this country. If my perception has any validity, is that a legacy of the Klan? Well, the Klan didn't create white, pure white attitudes, prejudices. They picked up on them. They picked up on scientific racism, which was flourishing by the 1920s. They picked up on other currents, and they packaged it and presented it in a very marketable way to ordinary people in the Midwest. Uh, and that continues. It's, however, today, I think the real dangers come not from the kind of bald statements of 100% pure white Americans. I don't think we see that much in responsible circles. We see coded language. We see activities that are based, perhaps, on some or all of an assumption of a white superiority, a white race. But it depends who you're talking about and where you're talking. Again, uh, um, the variations, I think, are very important and sometimes missed in our, in our anxieties about today and where we are. 
And let me tell you my opinion, I think there's evidence for this, that there's a great deal of hope, not just in my grandson James, but in many, many, many young Americans under the age of 40 who don't think about some of these issues, particularly race, the way old white men think about them, that the times have changed. And that's why I'm going to continue to hope that the moral arc has been bending far too slowly, in my opinion, but bending toward justice. Thank you very much.